Well, thanks, uh, Tina and um, uh, Chris, for the invitation to speak um, this afternoon. And uh, thanks, Michael, for a fascinating insight into what's going on in the US. My uh, topic I was asked to speak on is, of course, um, also hi highly uh, relevant, given the pronouncements of the last week or so in federal, government, federal cabinet and so on. Can the fossil fuel industry change its spots, and where are we going to go in shifting toward decarbonisation? As uh, Tina outlined, my background is in fossil fuels, uh, at least until the end of the 80s. Um, ever since I've been involved in trying to change direction, I guess you can call it. And from my point of view, I think climate change is really a question of risk management. I've been involved in high-risk ventures all my life. Uh, initially, in the very early years, the first offshore <laughs> semi-submersible rig off Scotland designed for the 100-year storm, which came six months after we started and presented a very interesting trip down the North Sea to end up off Rotterdam because nobody could stop the rig moving. Um, it focuses your mind on really what problem are we actually dealing with. And my difficulty, I think, in the debate that's gone on in this country is we've never had a really serious discussion yet about climate change and what the, pro the size of the problem really is. Just to rehash... We've seen so far about one degree C warming uh, relative to 1880-90 uh, baseline, probably 1.2 if you take a more genuine uh, pre-industrial level. We've got about another 0.5 degree C built into the uh, system because of inertia in the global climate system. Two degrees C is now pretty much viewed as very dangerous, not just dangerous. We're already seeing dangerous climate change at about the current level. Three degrees C, I think, increasingly is seen as outright social chaos in the way the world might develop if we ever hit it. And four degrees C is basically a uh, totally uh, disintegrating global community. That's what we're dealing with. Now, the Paris Agreement um, is aiming for a 1.5 to 2 degrees C temperature increase range as a limit. The actions that people have agreed to take in Paris will give us somewhere between 2.7 and 3.5, depending on who you believe. So we have a long, long way to go before we get anywhere near uh, reaching the objectives of the Paris Agreement. And Paris basically is not, it contains no legally binding commitments on anybody. I won't waste a lot of time on this, but this is the record of what's occurred in recent years, and you can see that um, relative to that same baseline, 2016, we were 1.24 degrees C above the baseline, and things have been moving very quickly. Uh, again, Michael's touched on much of this, but we're now seeing record uh, evidence of climate change occurring, and there really is no doubt that this is human-related. I mean, any sensible risk management approach to this uh, would, would not discount any of this at all. Now, the implications of that is we've probably already passed climatic tipping points at the levels of warming we've already seen, let alone the additional amounts that's coming through the system. And in my view, we're not going to be able to solve this problem unless we move to some sort of emergency action, a bit akin to moving the economy to a war footing and changing the approaches we take, because the market economy solutions to all of this uh, are not going to work in the time space of the time we have available. And the sorts of things we're, li we're likely to get into, I think I've just listed some there. Noticeable amongst them is the sea level rise, where I think uh, the US uh, NOAA National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration have just increased the level of maximum sea level uh, possibility to 2.5 metres by 2100. So what's pretty clear is that 2 degrees C is too high, and it's now the, the boundary between dangerous and extremely dangerous climate change. Now, looking at the fossil fuel industry, um, I'd just like to pack paint a, an economic picture on where we're going to on these things. Um, if you look at the, uh, the tipping point, uh, well, sorry, just before I get to that, the tipping point issues uh, in the global climate system, the big problem is when you get to the stage where you flip from one uh, relatively stable climate 
uh, situation to another one which is far less conducive to human development. And that's a picture, and the bottom line is basically the temperature graph through the Holocene period, the blue line. The, uh, at the right-hand side there you see the IPCC scenarios that we're currently talking about, either keeping temperature below 2 or around 2 in the green line, or business as usual at the top, the 8.5 line. And then the Paris range, and you can see the, uh, the current scientific view of when we might get into tipping point problems. And so you can see in this that on the left-hand side here that the West Antarctic ice sheet uh, potentially becomes a problem. Greenland, uh, Arctic summer sea ice, alpine glaciers, coral reefs are all moving to tipping point levels within the range of the Paris Agreement, even possibly below the 1.2, 1.5 degrees C range we're talking about. And these are the, point, the points at which the whole process becomes irreversible. And there's little you can do about it. Now, in managing risk, I mean, the, the essential thing, in my experience, is you have to actually be honest about the problem you're dealing with. And frankly, we're not being honest about it. We're assuming that it's some relatively um, minor, not minor issue, but it's something we've got plenty of time to deal with. We have a fair bit of flexibility in the system before we have to take serious action, which I'll come back to. And all of that is, frankly, not the case. Now, if you look at some of the economic implications of this, the Pearl River Delta in China has 120 million people probably by the middle of the century. It contains or produces 40% of China's export income. Most of that area is less than two metres below sea level. And the second greatest number of people estimate at risk of flooding anywhere in the world. And it's not possible to defend it against sea level increase. If you look at the Mekong River Delta in Vietnam, you see similar sorts of things. Much of it is below two metres sea level increase, 40% of agriculture production, 50% of rice production, and so on. So a one metre sea level increase will flood 30, 50% of the delta itself. And a two metre sea level rise will probably double that. You look at the Nile River Delta, which is the granary basically of the Middle East, and a one metre sea level increase will flood one fourth of it. The Himalayan and uh, uh, Tibetan Plateau, with the freshwater rivers flowing through that. The um, four-fifths of the China grain harvest come from irrigated land using that sort of water. My point of putting this up is that the sorts of changes we're going to see by the middle of this century are going to fundamentally alter the economic system of the world. And there's nothing that politics is going to be able to do about that. It's happening, it's happening now, you're already starting to see the impact of those things occurring. And that's the backdrop against which you have to look at any business proposition in terms of the, the way the fossil fuel industry, for example, might respond. Because the growth uh, expectations that people have for maintaining the system are frankly just not going to be there, or they're going to be totally different. If you look at Bangladesh, what people um, actually don't know is that one third of its land areas with one meter of sea level, and a rise of that level would displace more than basically 20 million people. India, a few years ago, surrounded Bangladesh with a double security fence, which is patrolled by 80,000 troops. The first climate change fence designed to keep climate refugees in. So those sort of things are happening. Uh, we don't hear about them in this country at all. Now, what's happened, um, obviously, over the develop developments, particularly since the end of World War II, that humanity has become really the dominant global force. And if you look at the Global Footprint Network, um, we need, on aggregate, in aggregate globally, about 1.6 planets of biophysical capacity to survive. If we all lived at Australian levels, we'd need basically 5.4 planets. So Australia is really one of the most, despite our uh, <coughs> perceptions to the contrary, one of the most selfish and unsustainable societies on Earth. And to a large extent, it's due to the unnecessary dominance of fossil fuels in our energy mix. Because we actually have probably the best renewable resources in the world if we chose to use it. So what we've got is a completely untenable geopolitical situation. As climate change escalates, Australia cannot stay in this position and have any international credibility. 
If you look at um, climate and energy, they're inextricably mixed. And this, the, uh, the bars here show the total emissions if you burnt the um, <coughs> fossil fuel reserves, not resources, but the recoverable reserves. Uh, green, basically, is gas, uh, orange is oil, coal, black, the total. Now, the scientists tell us we can only burn less than 30% of the existing reserves, the red arrow, uh, to have a 50% chance of staying below 2 degrees C. But we know that 2 degrees C is too high, and we know that a 50% chance are pretty low odds uh, to achieve that. So why are we continuing, then, to explore for fossil fuels if we can't, basically produce what we uh, might discover? And what value do we place on fossil fuel companies in the market? Because clearly, at the moment, they're assuming that they can keep on doing this ad infinitum. And it's just not true. But it's worse than that, because if you take 50-50, it's not particularly good odds. So what risk are you prepared to accept? I mean, you don't get in a plane to fly to Melbourne on the basis you've got a 50% chance of getting it. So this is IPCC work again. The emissions, this is the probability of success of staying below 2 degrees C and the budget you have of emissions to basically meet 2 degrees C. The emissions to date is that grey bar. So if you want, say, a 33% chance of success, that's the budget you've got, and uh, take away the emissions so far, and that's how much we can spend. We can uh, essentially burn from now on. This is the famous carbon budget. If you increase the odds, um, the budget reduces uh, to 66% there. Now, if you take something more realistic of 90%, which is actually not particularly good odds, good odds even so, you have no budget left. Now, that means we shouldn't be burning any more carbon today, full stop. Now, it's not going to happen, of course. But you, should, you have to, therefore, reassess your attitude to this problem if that's the reality we're facing. So the fossil fuel worldview basically says population is going to increase. To alleviate poverty, economic growth is essential. Growth requires energy. A massive expansion of fossil fuels is inevitable, as other sources can't meet this demand. Global warming is important, but it's relatively secondary to growth. And things like CCS will handle the warming impact. Sounds strange. It came from Malcolm Turnbull last week. It comes up every five years, exactly the same thing. It's been happening for 25 years now. That's the fossil view, view of world energy. And if that is what we follow, in the next 25 years, we're going to consume around 70% uh, of all the fossil fuels consumed since 1900. And that's in a world where we have no carbon budget. If you look at the emissions, you get a similar picture. And you know, this is just completely insane. I mean, but that is what is being still put out by fossil fuel companies, uh, the Shells, the Exxon, the BHPs, and so on, despite all of the rhetoric around the Paris Agreement, that somehow we will find a solution which involves things like clean coal and carbon capture and storage and so on. It ain't going to happen. So corporate rationale is basically they'll Companies will reduce their own emissions, as all of the websites indicate. A uh, great deal of rhetoric about that. But they can't take wider leadership until governments set their clear low-carbon policy. That's unlikely in the next decade or so. So therefore, continued investment in fossil fuel is justified, and the risk of assets being stranded is low. And major changes to the energy market take a long time, so don't expect rapid adjustment. And then in addition to that, you have the poverty alleviation argument that it's essential that we continue to alleviate poverty in countries like India. The economic rationale uses this sort of argument about cash flow, which says that, look, the bulk of a cash flow in a <coughs> fossil fuel project is actually recovered in 10 to 15 years. So investment basically is justified in the absence of government policy, and because we get our money back that quickly, and governments won't move very quickly, then uh, it's a justified continuation of our business. So basically what we're doing is locking the risk in today, and that's the sort of thing that comes out of arguments like the Adani mine in Queensland. The IAA, the International Energy Agency, however, rather begged to differ. This is their picture from last November's um, World Energy Outlook which shows what's going to happen to coal under the various scenarios they use. 
Now these, uh, to take an example of Michael's um, misrepresentation in the US, these scenarios are continually misrepresented. The fossil fuel industry will come out with the top two scenarios, which are either the current policy is a thing called the new policy scenario, which is the stuff that people have committed to do but haven't yet done. Um, but the real two degree scenario is the green line. And as you can see, coal is in major decline from now on if you want to hit the two degrees C target. You don't hear this coming from the Prime Minister. It's not what the Minerals Council of Australia is, is feeding in. Uh, they use the top two scenarios saying, look, we desperately need this coal to alleviate poverty in India. I probably have run out of time to get into the other big issue that's um, looming, which is the uh, energy return on investment. Because what is occurring is that in the fossil fuel world is that we have now used up the low hanging fruit. We found all the cheap oil and gas. That's why people want to go and explore in the Arctic, because uh, it's harder and harder to find major oil reserves in other parts of the world. That has absolutely fundamental implications. It's one of the things that was the cause of the global financial crisis that nobody wants to talk about very much. It combines the peak oil argument that has become unfashionable of late, as well as peak demand, uh, peak demand falling off. But what it means is because the energy surplus that we have available, um, which has been essential to run industrial civilizations, is now declining. In other words, it's costing more and more to get the energy uh, out that we need. We can't maintain economic growth any longer in the way that we used to. And that is why governments have been running around the world trying to restart the economy with quantitative easing, with cheap money. It's why, in many cases, we've got low interest rates at the moment. None of it is working because you cannot get enough energy surplus any longer to uh, maintain the rates of growth we used to have. And you then have the overlay of the climate problem on top of it, which is stopping, essentially, um, using fossil fuels in the way we historically did. So in other words, you can't use coal any longer in the same way. So the net result of all of this is we now are at an absolutely fundamental shift in the way that um, the global economy is going to work. It's going to have to be completely rebooted in, onto a totally sustain on a completely different sustainable footing if we are serious about handling these problems, which of course we may not be. We may decide it's all too hard. And frankly, the arguments that we see being put up politically in this country are becoming totally irrelevant to really addressing the problems we've now got. I think I might give it away there in the 15 minutes um, and the other stuff we can talk about in discussions.